I'm good. Um, so I am Laura Jana, and I am a pediatrician by training based in Omaha, Nebraska, um, which my husband likes to say is my mailing address. Um, I uh, got very actively involved in communicating initially pretty specific health messages to parents when I worked with Dr. Spock, those of you old enough to know Dr. Spock, the pediatrician, um, but very quickly moved on to the idea that we need to do more intersecting health and education, that you can't separate out these different areas when we're looking at, at positive outcomes for children. And then I started to look where the children were, and I got very actively involved in early education and child care, including owning a child care center for 10 years and looking at how do we operationalize and scale high-quality early childhood education when a lot of people didn't think it was education yet. And also, by saying operationalize and scale, it's almost by definition goes against what we think is really critical for high-quality early childhood experiences. And then with a background in neuroscience, my most recent work, which brings me to things like this in particular, I've always had an interest in the neurosciences, and I got very excited in the late 90s as all of the, you know, the decade of the brain and all the mounting evidence about connecting of neurons in the developing brain um, and all of the stuff that sort of fuels the research we just heard about. Um, and I thought, that's a really powerful message. I get a lot of, you must be a very nice person when I tell people that I focus on early childhood. But if I could bring neuroscience plus some business policy economics into it, so I started looking at what would it take from a concrete and business and policy and economic level to change life trajectories for children, especially those born into poverty and facing adversity, which has me spending half my time with business audiences and half my time with early childhood, parenting, pediatric circles. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chamba Raghavan. I'm with UNICEF. And a big shout out to four of my colleagues who have traveled with me from New York, from UNICEF headquarters. The five of us here are representing over uh, our staff in over 190 countries. Uh, the reason I'm here is to learn uh, and to share. And uh, you know, we've been uh, diehard fans of neuroscience in UNICEF. It really helped us pivot uh, our arguments with government, our arguments with the private sector, our arguments with communities and our arguments with families. And it really, I think, brought about a revolution and hope. So I'm here, I think, uh, to share a message of hope. Uh, personally, um, I went to the other Penn, Penn State, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. So I left that part out. <laughs> yes, so Laura and I connected on being fellow Nittany Lions. We were better at football. I know you say that. But, um, yeah, so I went to Penn State years ago. So it's very good to be back in Pennsylvania, Keystone State. Um, you know, really um, excited to be here and to learn from all of you. Uh, my career um, started out as a, a psychology uh, major, you know, three majors actually, literature, psychology, and philosophy in my undergraduate. Uh, got my master's in applied psychology in India. All my education was in India at that time. Uh, and then came to Penn State for my doctorate have uh, worked in academia for in Penn State, UCLA, uh, Clemson University, University of uh, South Florida, New College of Florida, which has been in the news, uh, not at the time that I was there, wasn't in the news very much, except that it was a brilliant college. Um, and then moved to Thailand, where I served in UNICEF uh, for six and a half years. Uh, our office covered about 14 countries uh, and 15 island nations of the Pacific and moved to New York in 2018 to be with this brilliant team. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Banks. I'm Deputy Chief of Prevention, Intervention, and Trauma at the School District of Philadelphia. Um, I've been working in mental health for forever. Um, and when I came to the district five years ago, uh, me and the team that, that we, I've grown, uh, we've been focusing on um, growing the continuum of supports uh, that are available uh, for our students and families and uplifting their voice uh, in the support. So it, we're doing it with them and, and not something that, that we are pushing on them. So um, I, I'm, he I'm here from the school district to, to say what we're doing and, and how it ties in with everything we're talking about. Wonderful. So Kim, you don't have to introduce yourself again. I think we have a full understanding of uh, who you are and what you've accomplished. Jamie, something you say got my attention and I want to visit it. When we think about the work that Kim has presented to us and we think about the efficacy of that work in real time, 
where do you see this playing out from a local remit? Yeah, I think it's uh, groundbreaking, and we often don't want to think about it in the way in which, like, this is what they need, right? Um, and this has, by, by doing this, we see all of the, we, these positive things um, come out of it. And so I even look at work that I've done this summer where we were uh, having a camp for kids and um, the print for high schoolers. And principal said to me, this sounds great, but my kids need to work. So they're not going to sign up. And so I went to funders and I said, can someone siphon this please? Somebody? And we were able to secure for the week camp, $350 siphons. And all of a sudden, all of these kids started applying. And then once we talked to them afterwards, while they were there and then after, and they said, you allowed me, I, we still needed this financial um, uh, support because it's not just for me, it's for my family, right? And by giving them that, they were then allowed to focus on themselves. And so I think often we, I find people are polarized in, in thinking one way and not thinking about the full impact of what something, um, I'm gonna say it's minor, but, but something so simple the impact could have. So Kim, what brought you to the place of taking a 360 degree perspective, not falling into norms about assessing people's points of view, uh, but really looking at how an economic approach to a social problem, a practice, uh, could be more impactful than the streamlined, regular things that we have historically done. Well, you know, I certainly don't want to think it's all about, give the impression that it's all about me or my individual approach. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, this study is very much a team effort uh, across multiple disciplines. And I think having that multidisciplinary perspective has been very helpful. Um, you know, I have spent my career studying adversity and how it relates to brain development, but very far removed from the policy space. And so having the ability to collaborate with true experts um, who can, you know, uh, who understand and can um, uh, make meaningful connections to policy and what is likely and what is possible has been invaluable. Wonderful. Laura. I'd like for you, because you and I talked last night uh, during dinner, I'd like for you to talk about nationally this impl the implications of investing to build capital in children. Great. And then I always like to start out by saying, I have, if I'm being honest, I didn't see children as future workers. And I think there's a very significant risk of talking to lots of people where you get pushed back the minute that you say things like return on investment and youth human, human capital and things. At the same time, based on the presentation that Kim just gave and this kind of research, it's very easy for, I mean, it's great to work in early childhood because everybody loves people who work in early childhood, right? As a pediatrician, people like pediatricians who are nice. And then it's the announced time to get back to business, right? So we can do these things. So we say children are a future and it matters the most, but where do we really invest? Putting it in actual literal, whether it's economic terms, sort of in business or community. And what I've found at a national level, because a lot of what I've been doing is how do you translate? I was much more, I mean, my preaching to my choir was pediatricians and educators and early educators and social services and things and people at UNICEF. And I, you know, that's my space. And I taught myself the language of business and economics and policy. And the numbers and the sort of hard data that you get takes that perception. We heard this morning about you know, business marketing, for example. I like to see myself as marketing messages where I take good ideas, good content, and I market those, not products, but that. This is an idea that I can run with because when I'm talking to people who are going to like say you must be a very nice person, time to get back to business, you can talk about the economics. And when you think about marketing that message, you already have people who are thinking, yeah, I don't believe you. They're going to go spend their money on alcohol. Like it is a super common, whether people say it or not, idea that if you give poor people money, they're going to go buy alcohol and they're going to buy tobacco and they're not going to do the, or they're going to stop working. Right. That's why I think this is so valuable because from a national discussion, Again, if you're trying to reach people not just preaching to the choir and in the spaces that I come from, that the choir is not who has the money. Mm -hmm. So this idea of crossing over and making it make good dollars and cents at the same time is really valuable. 
I, I completely agree with you, Laura. Um, you know, that question, like, aren't they just going to waste some money, is probably the number one question that we get. Interestingly, many, many years of social science research does not support that, right? So if you actually look at if different people get a windfall, and this has nothing to do with my study, but right, other research, if different people get a windfall of cash, who's likely to spend that money on alcohol? That's high-income people, not low-income people. Low-income people use it for their basic needs. Um, you know, there's been uh, research done by frameworks looking at framing, right? If you frame policy in terms of vulnerable families, nobody likes it, right? Everybody in this country thinks, like, if, if you come from means, you think you earned it. And so you don't feel sorry for people if they're vulnerable, right? But if instead you frame it in terms of the future workforce, that is much more compelling to many people. And by the way, I got, using this framing, I got invited to keynote at the World Bank's annual meeting. And they had another researcher present the data on who is the most universally disliked, people don't you know, feel empathy for them, and it's poor people. And it was across the board. And it was even with people like in the areas of, like, at the World Bank, where even if you think that you don't, we have this sort of gut reaction towards people who are poor. And we apply all sorts of, which I would say sort of our brains are, are wired to frame things. We frame them in this like, you know, misguided sense of, of what they're going to do with the money. So to that end, Chimba, how do these cognitive blind spots play out globally? Wow, big question, because it depends where globally you're looking at. But I think overall for us, research like Kim's is extremely valuable uh, in terms of not only framing, but sort of moving people into a, into a realm of hope, into saying that uh, your biology is not destiny into saying that, uh, you know, this whole debate on nature versus nurture is passé, that it is about environments and what you do in vulnerable contexts that really makes a difference. So that has worked. Uh, what else has worked is sort of, you know, I don't want to sound cliché. I don't want to sound like a marketing guru or something, but I am not. But, but really, um, you know, the point of, you know, when you change the beginning of the story, you change the whole story. I think that is starting to resonate with a lot of governments. So where it sits globally, uh, you know, we, 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 of course, we're a child rights organization. We start discussions with, this is absolutely a child's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so is health and so is everything else, right? So you need to have the bolsters for that argument. You really need that hard data that show them, listen, by doing this, it's a win-win situation, you know, by, uh, by investing in the most vulnerable and by investing in, you know, uh, sort of relatively small investments, the returns are quite high. I think that seems to gel, especially in countries which are aiming to move from low middle income status uh, into sort of a high income status and gain a uh, world stage. Then the second piece where it's become really, really important is um, evidence like this has led to, uh, in our field, and I don't know how many of you have heard about nurturing care. Okay. What do you think a child needs? Very quickly. What do you think? I mean, think about the child that, uh, uh, that Tim started with, right? Let's think about the child that we have manifested in our brains. What does that child need? Laugh. Attention. Health. Laughter. Sorry. Laughter. Laughter. Love, love, love. Love. Love is the first one. Security. Security. Acts. Empathy. Structure. Empathy. Acts. Sorry. Acts. Heart. Yes, heart. Hands. 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 Okay. All right. So you got most of it. The nurturing care framework basically identified five elements: health. Good health, adequate nutrition, early learning opportunities, safety and security, and what we call responsive care, which is the love, the heart, the cuddles. So evidence like this really helped us translate what it all means in the global context. So that kind of a framing then gives us a leeway to talk about this is what the child needs holistically. This is how you can get a workforce that is highly competent and efficient and so forth. And so we're able to have those conversations. Thank you. So we have about five minutes before we get into question and answer. Mm -hmm. So I want each one of you to take a minute, right? So then we have a little bit of time left over to tie together what Kim has shared with us and the level of intentionality 
you believe we need to have towards building this capacity in families and in children? I am starting with you, Laura. Okay. Um, I'm going to make it take it to this level of first of all looking at brain capital, and I, you know, I'm thankful um, that Harris and I know each other, and I got invited here, and I met Zab at the UN General Assembly. Um, discussing this, I think brain gives us a really good opportunity to pull a lot of this together, right? Um, and I think when you have the um, cross sector, like you've got on your research team, but like we've got at this really impressive gathering, bringing those people together is going to be really important. Um, I'm also going to pull on some of the, what we heard this morning as well, because I cross a lot of areas, but I think all the things we heard about getting good at marketing messages, that we're not just selling product, but we have to sell ideas and we have to you know, consider different perspectives and things. The short version for you is I essentially went out there trying to tackle these issues. I did give a TED Talk. You can watch it on 2X because I talked half as fast as I am now because I have one minute. But looking at, I think, a skills framing is really useful because it crosses over into 21st century jobs, workforce, innovation, entrepreneurial skills. Then you say, let's look at what those skills like communication, collaboration, teamwork, adaptability, resilience, good perseverance, et cetera, look like in the earliest years. Cool baby brain science to back it up. Huge returns on investment. Like if you're intelligent about your economic investing, everybody's seen the Heckman curve where it's basically the earlier you invest, the bigger return you get, and oh, by the way, those returns are biggest for the people who need it most, right? So it addresses poverty. So I think by doing that framing, you can cross political divides, you can talk, cross professional silos, um, and really make the case for early childhood. So that's sort of a summary, not quite what you asked, but try to pull it together. Could you repeat your question? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I want to make sure I answer. Sure. So, so my question was, and, and Laura, you did answer it, how do we bring the pieces together uh -huh. to truly invest in the most vulnerable group? I believe Kim used that word, vulnerable population, right? So if children are our most vulnerable population. How do we pull together the content that we've heard today? Because the through line for me is the generation that needs to be impacted the most. So from your perspective. So I, I guess if I had to answer in one word, coalitions. Coalitions. I think that's the way to go. I think we need to have different uh, uh, segments of society coming together to raise their voice. I think this is one example of you know a very diverse group of audience that has come together. Uh, that voice needs to be raised with hard evidence right now. Uh, for me, the messages that we carry as UNICEF forward is early moments matter. Right? Eat, play, love. It sounds like you know, a bunch of molecule, you know, it's a bunch of, you know. But it really is backed by science. The eat is that food, the nutrition, the insecurity, the health, etc. The play is that heart and the love and the responsive care that you all talked about. Uh, uh, you know, play is absolutely fundamental to a child's development. It's not something that is a, is a nice to have, but a must have. So I think if there are coalitions that really elevate such a message, that would be really critical. And I'm just going to chime in only because Australia just released their um, national statement on play. When we look at can you attach these things to, like, is brain the right focus yeah. for all of this? Um, and they're using the brain science, and you can make really compelling arguments if you think about what play actually does. And it's all the hard skills, and it's all the soft skills, and it has all this relevance. And I always say the workplace is starting to be more playful because it gets you all these benefits. Yeah. But that's where you can tie it all in if you start looking for it. I would say that, you know, in my setting, we see a child in need, and we just look at the behavior we see. And I say, you know, that behavior is only a symptom and often isn't the root of, of what needs to happen or what's going on, right? So I, I, um, I don't even have the right word. We have to be upstream. We have to be more preventative. We have to look all the way back um, to, you know, how to support our, our youth and families from the beginning so that we can be so upstream that they didn't have that tool, bob, the tool, tool, ah, tool bag, <laughs> right? Um, that we've equipped to the parents with that tool bag to give them what they need and then the kids continue to get resources so that they can use those resources and not wait until we have an identified issue and then try to work backwards, it's too late. Yeah, I, I would say empowering families, right? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, 
the beauty of cash, again, is that families can use it how they see fit, so we're not coming down from on high and telling them, this is how you need to use your resources, or you can have this resource, but only if you do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and then not even just related to cash, but related to other benefits as well. There are so many barriers and hoops that families have to jump through to have the basic dignity of things like healthcare, right? So Medicaid, they constantly have to re-up. I don't know if people are aware of that, but you know, it's not like you sign up and you're done. So you get dropped if you don't renew, even if nothing changed in your circumstances. And, and stop so, getting services yes, when you're dropped. Yes, right. So, and it's, you know, complicated and difficult. You can imagine if you had all of these, you know, um, benefits offices in your life where you had to go to continually re-up, that it's challenging. And so who ends up not uh, receiving the benefits they deserve is our children. Yeah. And it's magnified globally. This is, by the way, when you take it to a global level, it's not just the Medicare that people have to apply, but just basic services that are. And patients who are sitting at work, I'm just going to toss in, you can take all these concepts and put them and overlay, start reading all the business literature. And when you look at what you need, psychological safety, and when you have it, you have increased willingness to make mistakes, try new things, increased workplace productivity. Yeah. All of these principles, when you start looking for them, cross over because it's sort of what we need as humans, right? Getting the humans back into the sort of work equation. Um, you can see without the early childhood work, a lot of people I talk to, they see it as completely separate. They don't see yeah. that crossover. So I just thought I'd toss that in because when, when I look at the business literature, I see this all over the business literature as well. Thank you. So we leave time for question and answer. We probably ate into some of that time and Shotlin may stab me, uh, but I wanted to give our panelists who are all individually reservoirs of a lot of content that is beneficial to this conversation. But can we take one or two questions? Yes, one or two. Yes. <laughs> yes sir. You know, I have a question around uh, the reframing of the messaging and the positioning. It seems like that's been a, a big theme today. So in a perfect world, where would you say we need to start to reframe that on a, on a more mass level in terms of if you think about uh, well-being and how it's being positioned in the media, everybody has a different meaning, a definition of well-being. So it's been difficult to uh, navigate that. But um, if it's not the media, is it the university system? If it's not that, what... Where do we start to reframe all of this so that we can almost start again, so that we can redefine, even in some ways, change the nomenclature a little bit? So, uh, go ahead. Yeah. No, thanks. I think it's an important question. At UNICEF, we spent a lot of time debating exactly that, right? So we actually have a new vision. And we have three P's as the answer for the reframing. It needs to be in policies, it needs to be in programs, it needs to be in parenting support. So it's, you know, the family support and all of that. So the linkages that are needed, public-private partnerships, all of us sort of raising our voices to say, where are the young children in the policy landscape? Where are the young children in programs that we provide? Where are the young children, uh, you know, and how are they being supported? through parenting practices. One of the things that we learned through an initiative we have called Family Friendly Policies, uh, which talk about four things that are needed globally, core interventions. When we asked parents, what is it that you need to raise your children around the globe? We got three things, time, resources, services, right? Time, so we, we sort of got a bunch of experts. We called it the Conference of Thinkers. And uh, they guided us on, on, this, on this process. And we learned that you need parental leave, parental, not just maternity. The dads need to be involved. Uh, breastfeeding support and ensuring that children have the right staff for their brain capital. Affordable, accessible, quality child care and child benefits, which we have talked about today. They have to come together, at least a score. Of course, there's a lot more that you can add to it from context, but... 
But it's, and I'm going to say you also partly answered your own question at the very end because yes. I think we don't have shared language. Yeah. Right. When I I can present the almost the exact same PowerPoint to a business audience on one day and the next day is a bunch of preschool teachers and I switch the order and I switch the pace and I switch it's the same substance. Exactly. And if you look in the TED talk that I gave, I think what helps is having a shared nomenclature and you go, well, yeah, I care about that. Yes. And then you find out that these unlikely partners. Yeah. I think rallying around early childhood, but also rallying around brain science, which is that health, is it education, it's both, all of a sudden you get some unifying things to rally around. And the nomenclature and the words and language we use, sometimes you find unlikely partners because you didn't know you were talking about the same thing. So you think, so you're saying it's interchangeable? So it's and what you're talking with the businesses? Uh, this, again, for this topic, for example, right. some people are super interested in poverty, right? I follow the poverty. I was on your call when you couldn't go out into the homes again and you were presenting your research right as the pandemic hit. And I'm like, I'm interested in poverty. But somebody else is interested in early literacy and somebody else is looking at social impact financing and somebody else is like, but we all have this core that we're interested in, like the results of this kind of study is of interest, but most people would not go looking at that literature because they don't know that they even right. have that shared interest. They wouldn't know where to look. Right. That's why I think finding those shared, that shared language and finding the interests for coalition building purposes. Thank you. Can you have a response to this? Uh, so, you know, in terms of framing, it's a really interesting question. And I think um, talking about empowerment, talking about dignity, right? Mm -hmm. And talking about how all parents want the best for their kids. Right, I think that is a concept that most people, at least people who have kids, can relate to to some extent, right? And so it, it in a way, that brings us together and stops the othering, right? right. If we assume that those other people are going to spend money in irresponsible ways, right? But then if you bring it around to children and everybody loves their children and wants the best for their children and just want to have the dignity and the resources needed to give their children a chance. Thank you. Well, any other questions? Yes. I know we talked about coalitions already, um, but I was just wondering how some key differentials would include, like, when talking about policy-based solutions, what would the like key, um, like, what would stop you know policymakers from implementing solutions into an actual? Sorry, couldn't hear that. So, are you asking about barriers or? Yeah, with the barriers. Okay. Barriers to implementation. Correct. Money. Even a step up from that, and then I'll let you do the more substantive answer. What I found, because policy was not my thing, right? I'm like, I'm a kid person, I'm a people person, I do the sort of translate the message. And what I found is if you start talking, like you jump in and you start talking about earned income tax credits, it's like having people read the phone book. Like for people who that's not your thing, it's really boring and dry. If you understand that if you're going to distill down to the two things children need most are caring, responsive adults, and you need these like caring interactions being one of them, and then you say, oh, but if you don't have earned income tax credits or you don't have paid family leave and you can't spend the time with the children during those critical years of brain development, all of a sudden it becomes much more interesting. I think from a policy standpoint, sometimes it's even getting people's attention of like, why is this a policy you care about? That's a lot of the translation and reframing of it. That's how I got into it, and it was not my area that I knew much about, and now I do briefings on the subject. But you can talk about the Jamie, you can jump in. I would say funding, and then it's cross-agency collaborations. Data agreements, data exchange, um, that is very, uh, trying and can kind of li limit um, collaboration and the coalition actually working as a coalition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I semi facetiously said money, but it's true, right? So if you say we need to expand the child tax credit and make it fully refundable, that is not at all budget neutral. And, you know, so it's the work of our economists to say, okay, there's a cost, but there's also a cost benefit ratio. So, for example, economists have looked at Head Start and it more than pays for itself simply by the reduction in prison time down the road for those kids, right? So a relatively small, you know, most kids obviously don't want to have criminal behavior, so it's a relatively small impact, but prison is expensive. And so uh, a small impact on reduction in criminal behavior is a large return on investment, and that's purely a financial argument, right? So we can, you know, we obviously are all on the, the side of supporting children for children's own sake, but even if you strictly look at numbers, it often becomes an economic argument. Can I just do one more thing on this last one? Political will mm. is a big barrier. And we've learned this from many countries around the world. 
In countries where early childhood development is prioritized and successful, we do see uh, a lot of improvement in not only child outcomes, but in things like retention, employee retention, and uh, you know, employer supported childcare increasing, expanding to other sectors, for example, all of that. But I think the thing that really drives it is find your champion in government, find that political will, find in, in, in a private sector organization, in your local communities, find that champion and join hands with them. And again, the idea of what you said about you know, agencies needing to come together, that comes up quite a lot. But really it's about political will and if you have a leader that is willing to drive it, it, do, it does go a long way and we can institutionalize those mechanisms and there is hope. Remember, that's a good segue to our last reflection from each one of you. All of our previous panels, I'm most, I'm, no, I'm sorry. My end, okay. all, of, all of our previous panels uh, provoked us to action. And so 30 seconds, call to action, Laura. All right, I'm going to state the obvious because obviously I think it works, but we're all here because we believe in the brain capital concept. I think we need to rally around something that's conducive for the cross-sector collaboration, that you can pull in the highest levels of business, the highest levels of the early childhood, <laughs> whatever part of that space you're in, of education and healthcare. And come, I, I think, again, is to Harris's point, I think we need a home for it and make it real. Because it's, I always say, I, I, I'm like the warm-up act. I go out and give hundreds of talks. There needs to be a structure behind it. Because you can get people's attention and say, this is what we should be doing, and we should be investing, and we should be doing these sort of, you know, whatever, <laughs> handouts, whatever it might be. And then you go, okay, but what should we do? That's why that's a really good study, because that's like something you should do or whatever. But I think we need to come together and formalize it, because we're, re we're reframing organizational structures and the way we approach things. And there's a lot more power in this sort of collective than there is in the siloed efforts. Ask the question, what about young children? Just ask that question. I think all of the other answers will start coming, because we have very complex evidence at the back end. We have to simplify this. We cannot go with, you know, very complex. I mean, the complex evidence has an audience, such as ourselves, right? But I think when we go into communities, for example, just asking the question, what about young children in your community, in your family, in your company, in your organization, in your ecosystem? I think then you will identify the champions, you will identify what policies are there, you will identify which interventions really work. And then the answers will come in a contextually relevant manner because there isn't one size that will fit. I mean, just because we deal with 190 countries, we get pushed back. We cannot take one model and parachute into a culture. So the best way to do that would be to ask the question, what about young children in your community? That would be my rallying call. I would say that in all that comes out of this and all that we do, we have to make sure we are uplifting the voices of, of the folks that are going to use these yes. services and need these services and using their voice and not and not taking that agency away from them, actually giving them the agency. And so, you know, I, I think that is the key to make sure that we are going in the right direction and not not just uh, building what we think needs to be uh, built, but what, what is actually needed. I would say support families, yeah. empower parents to support their children trust parents to support their children and recognize that our children are our future adults in society and need to be supported now for us to continue to be a successful society.